Um, today we are going we are going to run this outreach activity that is hosted by the CHBH and the Institute for Mental Health here at University of Birmingham. Uh, this activity addresses not only the academic audience, but also hopefully professionals of the health and the social services, as well as the general public. The speakers will be Professor Jeroen Baez. Uh, he is Professor of Social Psychology uh, in the Department of Psychology and Cognitive Sciences at University of Trento in Italy. And Dr. Laura Crucianelli, who is currently recipient of the prestigious Marie Curie Fellow at the Department of Neuroscience at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And myself, uh, I'm holder of a grant funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the School of Psychology here at the University of Birmingham. Um, so, as I said, this is going to be an outreach activity, so it is it to encourage discussion and exchange between the academic and the non-academic audiences. Um, in order to do that and uh, encourage the discussion, please feel free to ask questions directly to the speakers by using the raise hand tool um, on Zoom. Caroline will be helping me with the questions and moderating the, all the questions. So thanks, Caroline, in advance. Um, alternatively, uh, you can submit your questions even uh, anonymously on Slido. Uh, Slido is an easy audience um, platform uh, that it's very easy to join. Uh, to do so, just uh, take out your smartphones and uh, open any web browser or just another tab on your browser and go to www.slido.com. Enter the event code, which is 16969. Um, you should uh, just do it now uh, so we can familiarize ourselves with the platform and you should be able to see the poll. Um, so please um, answer the poll um, and so we can have a, an idea of how our audience um, is distributed. Please <laughs> do that. Okay, we also have some clinician. <laughs> We're happy to know that. <laughs> okay, it seems to be quite, um, we, we have a lot of participants today. We, we are very happy about that. So we really hope that um, the discussion will be uh, taking place today. Okay. Okay, so we have some clinical researchers, some students as well, a lot of uh, researchers. <laughs> okay, and somebody from um, somewhere else. We, we don't know better. Okay, so um, All right, so uh, today, the workshop um, is about overcoming effective boundaries between the self and the other, perspectives on interpersonal interactions. So, uh, everybody realizes that we currently live in a society of continuous global exchange. Uh, therefore, the study of social interactions just became uh, quite relevant. In this series of talks, we would like to draw one line on how neuroscience helped us understanding some of the mechanisms underlying interpersonal interactions. To this aim, uh, we will cover the topics of empathy, at first by myself. Um, Professor Weiss will talk about mind perception in minority groups um, as a second talk. And finally, Dr. Laura Crucianelli uh, will talk about the role of affective touch in health and disease. So if there are no further questions or no questions from the beginning, I would just get started um, with the first talk. 
just please feel, feel free to, uh, to ask any questions now. Okay. So, um, I would like to start my presentation by asking you, uh, by asking the audience to take a moment to think of a situation in which they needed to highly rely on their empathy. Um, maybe with a patient or maybe um, with the user of the health and the social service they might be working for, or with a student. Uh, let's think of um, a student that came late <laughs> to the experiment or that had, was experiencing some um, specific difficulties or that just did not fit the experiment criteria on, um, at 8.30 on a Saturday morning. So <laughs> you might agree that empathy is quite an important resource to understand both the problem and the person and also to establish a good alliance with, um, between the service and the user or with the student or whatever is the situation we are thinking of. Um, so um, in my experience, at least, this is what I can bring today to this um, audience. I would like to share with you uh, my previous experience. Um, before starting my PhD studies, I have worked in a center for victims of intimate partner violence and also for an Italian NGO emergency whose mission is to protect and defend the universal human right of health and medical care. care. In the first case, my job was mainly about dealing with the first contact that the victims made with the center via in-person meetings or on the phone. In the second case, the job was very similar, but the users were people without the legal documents to be in the country. Um, and therefore, uh, it was quite difficult for them to access the national health system, although they required medical assistance. So what I would like to bring to this audience today is that I, I must admit that in some specific cases, not every time, but in some cases, it was quite hard for me to uh, fully empathize with the person in front of me. There were some specific situations in which I found harder to, um, to understand, uh, to, find, um, um, to find the ability to fully empathize with the person the, I was dealing with. And, um, and I, was, I found myself often thinking of how that was happening and I was told that maybe uh, one of the reasons why that was happening was, before, was because um, uh, I could not really relate to them. That the experiences that I had lived in my own life were too different, too far from those that these people had lived in their own life and therefore this could be one reason why in some cases it was difficult to find a common ground, a point of connection with the other. Um, but uh, mm, so is this really the case? This is the, the question I would like uh, you to think of. Is this really the case? Is, this really, uh, is it really the case that we need our, um, exper our past experiences to be able to fully empathize with the other? Because it seems a little counterintuitive, right, that um, to do um, a job, for example, in the health uh, system, then you would um, require the full range of human experiences in order to grant, to be able to, to always empathize and understand the, other, uh, the others' um, problems and, and inner states. Uh, so this is more or less the kind of question I would like to uh, answer today with this talk, whether we use and we, we rely to, uh, on our um, past experiences in order to empathize. But to do so, we need to start from the very beginning, of course. So first of all, what is empathy? Uh, you might um, have as many definitions as the people you ask what empathy is. Uh, but over the last decade, um, the um, uh, researchers have uh, reached a general consensus on uh, defining empathy as the ability to share the other's experiences by a mechanism of inner simulation um, and uh, the ability to explicitly understand um, the other's inner states thoughts and reasonings by a mechanism, for example, of perspective taking. 
So neuroimaging studies uh, showed that these two uh, big aspects of empathy are dissociable, both at an anatomical level, but also at a functional level, meaning that there are different brain areas that uh, subserve either one or the other of these aspects of empathy, but also that the time course of these um, of these empathic processes is different. One comes before the other, one is more automatic, more visceral, uh, has more affective uh, features than the other. Uh, but we certainly can say that as a rich and multifaceted process is also highly sensitive to many variables. Some of these variables can reduce either um, the experience sharing or the mentalizing reaction. Others, uh, other variables can enhance these uh, empathic processes. It certainly seems to be quite a natural reaction. And uh, it, mm, it is very important to realize that it can happen in fractions of a second. Uh, there are also uh, cues that can enhance both experience sharing and mentalizing aspects of empathy. So let's think, for example, of a person who comes to the service or um, that comes to us in some way expressing some sort of pain, like this person depicted on the screen. Or it might also be somebody who calls on the phone and express the condition of pain. The first thing you do, of course, is to ask what happened. And uh, what you might receive as an answer is that this person says that they got their finger hammered or in, uh, in the case um, when I was working for the Center for, Intim for Victims of Intimate Partner Violence, they might say that they were beaten by their partner. Um, but uh, of course, um, these people would use their voice to further convey their message, right? So instead of just saying, I got my finger hammered or I got beaten by my partner, they might say, I got my finger hammered or I got beaten by my partner. So using this, this in, uh, tone in the, in the um, speech and in, the, in what they are saying, that is called prosody. The prosodic information, the affective prosody, clarifies the meaning, the intentions, or the emotional content of the speech. It is quite a powerful element uh, in the communication process. And uh, we, uh, we have observed uh, that it can enhance transversely both experience sharing and mentalizing. However, it is also very important to realize that in, in this same study that we have conducted a few years ago, we also observed that uh, um, it can be detrimental when the prosodic information is incongruent with other cues to with other available cues to empathy. Um, and it is quite important to realize that because um, uh, in this kind of society, a lot of people um, e express themselves not in their mother tongue. And um, uh, when we learn a new language, uh, the prosodic information is something that is uh, <laughs> usually... Um, uh, uh, you, you don't really learn the, the, the way in which things are said in another language. So the way in which you would say something in one language or the other would be extremely different and can convey or reduce or be or interfere at least with the semantic content of what you are trying to express. And so, and this is just the first encounter, okay? So somebody that just comes there, uh, tells you what's ha what happened, and you have a few information to rely on and trying to understand what's happening. You might also um, notice that that person was expressing face, uh, a pain with their emotional, uh, with, with their facial um, expression, right? And that was quite an evident um, expression, emotional expression that was depicted on that face. Wow. However, it, it is quite interesting to know that uh, the emotion perception is a, um, a subject to a bias um, regard, um, sorry, that depends on um, how much expertise we have with, the, um, with that person, um, facial features, let's say. So what you might want to uh, realize is that um, when the facial expression is not particularly evident on someone's face, then we are much better to um, perceive the other's emotions in a face 
uh, of someone that is this, a member of your same ethnicity group um, when compared to uh, perceiving an emotion um, of pain, in this case, in someone that does not belong to your same ethnicity group. This, uh, this bias in perception can also transfer to higher order cognitive processes, such as, for example, the precision with which uh, we can maintain a phase in, in our visual working memory. So the buffer of how we use the information to um, process um, specific features of the stimulus. And uh, this is not all. Actually, the, this bias in emotion perception also affects empathy. So in a um, study that we have conducted a few years ago, um, we have asked a sample of participants uh, that were all Italian students and all Caucasian uh, to judge the, whether a face that was depicted in, uh, with a neutral expression in, uh, on the screen uh, was uh, receiving a painful uh, stimulation with the needle, uh, like for example, a needle of, the, of a syringe pricking the cheek, or uh, were um, receiving a neutral stimulation, for example, the gentle touch of a Q-tip always on the cheek. And what we observed was that the most natural reaction towards the other's pain was selective for the pain perceived by uh, somebody that belonged to the same ethnicity group as participants, or in this case of a Caucasian face. Uh, it, this experience sharing reaction was not therefore uh, ob uh, observed for the pain perceived by another ethnicity uh, phase. However, only a hundred milliseconds later, uh, we could observe a comparable mentalizing reaction for the pain perceived by the members of both ethnicity groups. So, uh, in this case, we have this important feature of the color of the skin that can be associated with, the, with all the semantic association that come from the um, uh, cultural background of the ethnicity group. But still, we know nothing about this person. Okay? And this is a, a lot that is, coming, that is going on already within a second, because this is a, a reaction that comes within a, a second. Um, that is already influencing our way to process information. Um, it might be intriguing to know that this is, um, uh, regardless of the semantic information and the cultural background that can be associated with somebody just for the way they look, um, this is not the only thing that affects our perception. But also, um, for example, uh, there are some facial features, like for example, the height to width ratio of a face that conveys um, judgment of trustworthiness perceived in a face, just for the way it looks. A couple of, um, a few scholars in the past have um, systematically studied this and they observed that if you ask freely a uh, sample of participants to, to freely judge uh, some faces of, of strangers, um, they would judge these faces on um, how, uh, on whether they look trustworthy or untrustworthy. And this depends on some facial features that nothing has to do, nothing have to do with the personality of this person, whether this person is really trustworthy or not. And we observed in a um, further study that uh, um, trustworthiness perceived in a, in a real face or even in a 3D model um, of a computerized face can affect our empathy. It affects the experience sharing reaction in such a way that only trustworthy looking faces would induce and elicit an experience sharing reaction. It would induce a mentalizing reaction for computerized faces. Um, but they, uh, but untrustworthy looking faces would not um, uh, elicit any empathic reaction, not in either in the more affective side of empathy, the experience sharing reaction, but not neither uh, in the more cognitive, the higher order kind of um, cognitive uh, sorry, aspect of empathy, the mentalizing reaction. Again, you know nothing about this person, you only rely on the facial features and still you, uh, you can observe how empathy can be um, affected. Um, and think whether you are in a situation where you, this person is in need and there is so much going on from the very first sight uh, when you first encounter somebody. 
Um, okay, so for example, oh, sorry. Um, so for example, uh, there are um, situations in which you uh, uh, in, in the in a social service or in a health service or with a patient or with a student, you might need to be willing to help this person. And um, we, um, there are a few scholars that in the past have observed that if you ask a sample of participants to read a narrative with a character uh, that is in need, uh, and you ask them to think, uh, to imagine how they could help this person, uh, the, the character of the narrative, or to remember one time when they had helped somebody uh, in need, or if you ask them to read the narrative without um, any further thinking of the character and this, this, the conditions of the character, then you would see that participants are much more willing to help um, somebody um, with which they engaged some sort of thinking, either remembering or imagining how they could help when compared to whether they read the narrative without any further thinking of, um, uh, on that person in need. So there are some suggestions already uh, that memory somehow can be involved in empathic processing in the social, in the pro-social behavior, for example. You remember that this is the question we are trying to answer. Uh, we are trying to answer whether we use our memories to empathize. So the um, neuroimaging studies um, support the um, the idea that uh, memory is involved to some extent in, in empathy. So, for example, we know that the brain reacts in a very similar way when it's retrieving an autobiographical memory. Memory. So the act of remembering a past experience of, your, of one's own life um, um, lets the brain react in a very similar way as when it is mentalizing with somebody's uh, inner state. So can you see it here that this frontal and parietal area in the brain are more or less uh, overlapping and they um, subserve these two different processes. The act of re retrieving an autobiographical memory, namely the past experiences, and the act of mentalizing, so a specific aspect of the empathic processes. Uh, however, we, um, with this suggestion that is are quite um, uh, intriguing, but they do not really say whether we do reactivate our memories, our past experiences when we are asked to empathize. So that's the question that we are trying to answer again. Do we use our past experiences, namely the autobiographical memories, when we empathize? And that's the time for the experiment. I'm going to show you now in a, bit, in a little bit of more detail um, uh, an experimental set, uh, setting. So uh, for this experiment, we have used uh, the electroencephalography, the EEG, which is the graphical re um, recording of the continuous electrical activity that is spontaneously generated by the brain. The EEG is a non-invasive technique, it's completely innocuous. It, uh, it records the electrical signal via an electrode cap that is put on participant's head with all these sensors. It looks like this, so we have here all the sensors and each line is the um, oscillatory signal of, uh, um, it's the, sorry, of the electrical signal. And uh, what we, um, the, in the recent advances in, uh, in neuroimaging and in ma machine learning had um, put us in the, in the condition to be able today to um, um, distinguish and extract um, the EEG pattern that is associated with, for example, with the presentation of a yellow dot. So when a person is exposed repetitively to a yellow dot, the EEG would, would have a specific shape, a specific distribution, a specific intensity, and so on. And uh, we, can, uh, we are able today to distinguish that EEG pattern from another EEG pattern that is associated with the presentation, with the exposure to a red dot, for example, in such a way that if you then only look at the EEG pattern, you are able to say with a certain degree of, of accuracy whether that EEG pattern was associated with when the participant was thinking of a yellow dot or of a red dot. And we can do the exact same thing also for more uh, difficult uh, and complex um, stimuli, like, for example, the representations in mind of somebody's memories. 
So uh, for this experiment, we asked a sample of participants to um, give us some information about their autobiographical experiences of pain, of physical pain, and they were exposed um, to this kind of stimuli. They saw a sentence describing a context in which somebody was uh, in a painful situation or in a neutral context, and then they saw a face with a neutral or a painful uh, express expression. As they said, the sentences could describe a context that either belonged to the autobiographical uh, experience of the participant or not, because we collected this information beforehand. And then we asked them to say how much empathy they felt for that person imagining in that specific context. So we only asked participants about their empathy after defining empathy for them. So here are a couple of um, examples of how the experiment looked like. How much empathy do you feel? So uh, we were collecting the rates, so uh, the explicit judgments of their empathy awareness, the empathy rates uh, that they reported for in each trial, uh, so for each combination of the sentence and of the face. And also the, we were uh, recording their electrical activity, the EEG, to see whether there was a, the online reactivation, so whether the participants were actually reactivating their memories as they were preparing this specific judgment. What we observed was that um, participants did report higher rates of empathy when uh, the phases were presented after an autobiographical context when compared to uh, when the phases were presented after an, a non-autobiographical context. Meaning that the only fact of having shared the same experience uh, with the target of their empathy, so the phases on the screen, was enough to enhance their empathy. Um, and also, we observed that this red blob here, it's evidence of the fact that um, we were able to distinguish the EEG pattern uh, for the memories that were reactivated as the participants were judging their empathy. So yes, it seems that memories are indeed relieved when participants are required to empathize. However, again, is this really helpful? Imagine that we have these uh, faces again, this time, this, um, this time only with neutral expression, but we tell participants that in some cases the face um, belongs to a clinical condition of um, insens congenital insensitivity to pain. It is rare, but it's real. So it's a patient that cannot feel pain as participants can, and somebody that uh, and people that are absolutely healthy and they can feel pain as participants can. So what we observed here is that um, the, the empathy rates of the participants were higher when healthy phases were depicted in painful context when compared to neutral context. However, we observed the exact same result also when it was patients um, that were described in a um, painful context when compared to a neutral context. And we observed the, this, this result also on a neural level. So the implicit reaction at a neural level, the EEG activity would tell us uh, this difference between the red line and the blue line is uh, evidence for the fact that the brain was still processing the pain and the neutral uh, situation of a patient that could not feel pain in a different way, as it could really perceive pain. Uh, so mm, this seems that if this is an empathic reaction, it's not really empathic. You're not really representing in a correct way the other's inner states. However, on an ex it must be said that on an explicit level, participants could indeed report higher rates of, uh, uh, um, of empathy for healthy faces depicted in a painful condition when compared to a patient per uh, perceived, uh, sorry, described in a painful condition, in a painful context. So, to sum this up, memories are indeed spontaneously relieved when we empathize with other senior states. So we don't necessarily need to have a specific memory to empathize because we saw that mentalizing can still occur even when we cannot directly draw from our own experience. But when we do have that experience, it seems to be spontaneously reactivated and contribute to the empathic processes. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation. If you have any question, please uh, let us know.
Okay. Um, is there anybody from the audience that wants to um, ask directly any question? Caroline, can you help me with that? There's nothing in the chat so far, Federica. Okay, so nobody raised their hand. So there is um, an anonymous um, um, person who asks a question on Slido saying, could you quickly define what you mean by empathy? As I said at the beginning of this uh, presentation, uh, empathy is quite difficult to define. Um, it's been, you, you can ask a hundred per people to define empathy and you would have a hundred uh, answers. Uh, as I said at the beginning, there is a general consensus on the fact that empathy is the ability to share the other's experiences by a mechanism of inner simulation meaning, um, and also to understand in an explicit way what the others is thinking or the others inner states. These two mechanisms of empathy rely on different brain uh, areas in such a way that, for example, in the experience sharing um, reaction, you would observe the activation of uh, um, some brain areas that, for example, belong to the mirror neuron system or to the limbic system such as, for example, the anterior insula and the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, as well as the, intra um, as the um, inferior parietal lobule, uh, and so forth. Uh, whereas for the mentalizing, like, uh, uh, which is also about um, theory of mind, for example, the, uh, brain, the brain would react more in the frontal circuitries of the middle prefrontal cortex and also in the parietal side of the, of the brain, such as the temporal parietal junction, and, um, and the precunius, for example. So uh, what I want to say with this is that there are visceral mechanisms that take place uh, in an empathic reaction and more um, uh, cognitive process such as, for example, taking the other's perspective. So to sum up, empathy is the ability to um, simulate the other's uh, inner states, but also to explicitly understand them. And this was how the empathy was defined to participants when they were doing the experiment. Could I ask a question, please? Yes. So my name is Stephen Mawaha. I'm an academic psychiatrist in the IMH. Uh, thank you so much for a fabulous talk. Uh, Thank you. I was really interested in the data that you presented about um, the extent to which you're able to empathize within your own ethnic group. Mm -hmm. so you alerted yeah. us to some differences. And I just, I mean, this is the second time I've heard that actually. Uh, oh. I, 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 uh, my original understanding was that it doesn't go for just empathy, it goes for actually quite a lot of emotions that people might have. And I, I've often wondered whether that's one reason or one angle that might uh, have an impact on racial bias. And I was just wondering what, what your thoughts about that were. So sorry, can you say again? Um, can you say again the question exactly? Yeah, sorry, it was a bit long winded. Um, <laughs> In essence, does this data give you some explanation of racial bias? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, yes, it does. Um, it's as unfortunate as it is, as, uh, sorry, as unhappy as it is, this um, result, it gives us some, uh, um, some suggestion that there is indeed an, um, a bias um, that depends on the ethnicity of the stimulus we have in front of us. And I say that because uh, previously to this specific study, um, there were um, studies that used different techniques that where they mainly located the, the activation of the brain in, in, um, uh, in this kind of um, cross-racial context. And they observed that, that there was a selective response for the pain uh, of um, the same ethnicity uh, groups as participants. And that was also cross racial So a uh, group of Caucasian participants would react uh, only selectively for the pain of Caucasian faces, but not of Chinese faces, and the same, and the other way around for Chinese Caucasian. Um, the other studies have shown the exact same uh, result, and we are indeed showing uh, that, yes, the most natural reaction is um, has a bias um, in our empathic reaction. 
So what it means is that we cannot necessarily feel what the other is um, feeling, but uh, in this case, what we are observing is that we can, to some extent, still empathize or un explicitly understand um, for uh, the pain perceived by both. So, although we can say that there are comparable reactions in um, at least to some sort of empathic pr um, processes, we still observe a bias in the most visceral and affective and automatic response to others' pain. So that's amazingly interesting. Is there anything we can do about it? So I'm speaking from a clinical perspective, working in Birmingham. Uh, which is a multi-ethnic city. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's very relevant. Um, what I uh, what I've tried to point out uh, was that um, uh, the ethnicity group can bias uh, the perception to different levels. Not only the empathy, but also just in perceiving the emotion, but also in the way in which we can maintain in memory uh, a face or two faces or or more. Um, what we can do is, for example, um, acknowledge that that even though we might be biased uh, on a more automatic reaction, we can still um, hold and think and try to put some effort in taking the other's perspective. And, we, we, and what this data is saying is that we can still mentalize, we can still try to understand uh, to a more explicit level the others uh, issue. But uh, what I think it is very interesting from the academic point of view, from the purely uh, academic point of view, is that these studies uh, show how um, these mechanisms can be extremely sensitive, extremely fast. And um, so uh, being aware of this uh, puts us in a, in a situation in which we can absolutely just take the time uh, extra time, maybe, to um, uh, further uh, engage in the interpersonal interaction we are having in that specific moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, there are some other questions. Oh, okay. Um, I'll take one more question and then I will try to answer to the other in a second moment because we uh, we can so we can move on with the schedule. So, somebody uh, Ruth asks, uh, could you just clarify which facial features were seen as more trustworthy? Uh, yes, uh, I'm very happy to <laughs> to answer this question. So, here um, we can see that the line of the eyebrows um, then. How deep was the nose cellion, is the nose cellion, and the, the, how pronounced as, are the cheekbones and the um, width of the chin? Um, are the facial features that convey um, a, trust, a judgment of trustworthiness um, in such a way that if you have very high inner, um, uh, inner eyebrows line, um, um, a shallow nose cellion, very um, not very pronounced cheekbones, and not uh, and a white chin. Then you would uh, this would convey um, more likely um, a judgment of uh, perceived trustworthiness in a face. Whereas when you look in this way with very uh, corrugated um, eyebrows and the cheekbones are very pronounced, the cellion, the nose cellion is very. Uh, deep, then this would tend to uh, produce uh, judgments of untrustworthiness. Uh, this means also that there is some emotion bias in here, such a, in, a, in such a way that a very trustworthy looking face would also tend to be perceived as more happy, and uh, a very untrustworthy looking face, is, face would tend to also be perceived as more angry, for example. This is something that, that has been, uh, under an experimental point of view, should always be taken into account. Uh, okay, I would um, close the Q&A session here and give the word to uh, Professor Weiss. Thank you very much for, for your interest. Jeroen, you can um, share your screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you Federica. So good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here and thank you for having me, first of all. So um, actually, um, I'm gonna 
pretty much try to answer Stephen's question of before. I mean, not that I'm going to give a full answer to it, but I'm going to talk about mind perception minority groups. And actually, I think mind perception is very much related to what uh, Federica has been explaining to us before, as it is very hard to empathize with someone without them having a mind. Or as Jamil Zaki said it, it is difficult to share experiences with or draw inferences from a mind one has not detected. So it is indeed true that what we typically do when we encounter human beings is that we try to figure out what are their mental capacities. I mean, can they feel pain? Can they have intentions? Can they have desires with which we can connect them and which we can form a conversation or indeed when it talks about pain or suffering, we can empathize with. Now, typically we do not do this with objects for the simple reason because they cannot experience any pain. Now, there's no sense of empathizing with something that does not have a mind. So to a certain extent, it does not come as a surprise that actually a lot of um, uh, research in neuroscience has shown that indeed, typically we use even separate brain regions to elaborate human versus non-human stimuli. No? And at least partly this has to do with the fact that indeed, I do not have to predict the intentions of a cup of tea uh, because it might fall off the table or commit suicide. No, that's not going to happen. It might fall off the table, but that's probably because somebody else has had the intention to throw it off the table. So only when I'm interacting with human beings, I actually have to get into their minds and know what their intentions or what their desires or their emotions are. Now, one way to study this, uh, which I find an interesting way to do, is actually to go and find the moments where the human object divide tends to fade. No? And this typically happens when people either objectify other people or dehumanize other people. And this typically means that we're gonna deny them certain mental capacities, that we're gonna um, um, deny them certain human capacities, like feeling certain emotions, like feeling having certain intentions and so on. Or when we do exactly the opposite, and that is actually anthropomorphizing objects, meaning that we're gonna attribute a mind to something that typically does not have it. And the reason I think that is interesting because it's exactly in these moments that um, mind might not be present, that it becomes interesting to see if when it becomes present, certain things happen, no? And this is exactly what we did in an experiment and I'm actually happy that two of the co-authors of that paper are present today, Paula Sessa and Federica Meconi, um, in which we try to do this with vegetables, no? Nobody ever protested because vegetables, vegetables get slaughtered every night in people's homes. No, we don't do that because they are objects that do not feel anything. And so we shouldn't cry when we uh, cut them to pieces and cook them. But is it possible that we can make people actually anthropomorphize objects by giving a minimal humanity cue? No. And here I actually used um, what my mother used to say to me when our cat had kittens and we were not allowed to give them a name, no? And the reason we were not allowed to give them a name because of course my mother didn't want us to keep them. And if we were not allowed to keep them, we had to take, we had to separate from them. And if we would have given them a name, they would probably uh, have a personality and they would probably be more attached to us because to a certain extent we would have anthropomorphized them. So the very simple thing that we did was we presented our Italian participants not with just a tomato but with a tomato with a name and in this case the name of the tomato was Carlo. The instruction is still given in Italian but I think it's clear to everyone. Now we compared those with vegetables that were not given a name but were typically described in terms of taste. For example, this sweet pepper is sweet. No? And so people had to learn these names and adjectives with uh, different types of vegetables. And immediately afterwards, we tried to measure to what extent are people actually capable of making more human associations with vegetables with a name versus vegetables without a name. And we found some differences. Some people tended to do it, other people to a lesser extent. And then in the final phase, we put it people again in an EG that I luckily do not have to explain anymore because Federica did that before me. So in which we gave them a pain decision task, a task that also Federica used, and in which people are presented with the vegetables that were only painfully stimulated, 
or neutrally stimulated. And people had to press a key on the keyboard to uh, respond to these stimuli. As you can see, some of them had a needle picked into them, others a Q-tip that was photoshopped next to it. Now we measured people's brain activity and what we found was not, of course, the typical empathic reaction you would find with human stimuli. This was not a full-blown empathic response, but actually what we found was that the empathic response was a function of the extent to which people started to see these vegetables with a name as more human. What you can see in the top graph of this, of this picture is basically the correlation that was the more they humanized the vegetables with a name, the more they also tended to have an empathic reaction towards them. And this happened already initially 200 milliseconds after they saw the vegetable and a bit more clearly actually after 300 milliseconds. So this indeed shows that when we give even objects that clearly do not have a mind some minimal um, humanity cue, that is enough for us to basically start humanizing them and the more we do that, the more we will be capable of sharing experiences and feeling to a certain extent what they are feeling you know, and showing some kind of empathic response. Now, the rest of the talk, I wanna actually focus on the opposite. What happens if we dehumanize or objectify people? Because this might show modulations that are very similar. No, if it is true that we indeed need to detect a mind before we can feel empathy and feel uh, something towards them, if we are denying certain human qualities, that might actually reduce empathic responses. But let me first talk about one of these processes, which is dehumanization. And I guess that everybody is familiar with these types of examples of humanization. Now, uh, typically we hear about this concept in very extreme situations like war and genocide, and exactly, this is what you see in the top left corner, for example. You see an excerpt of a, of a German, uh, Der das Sturme, I think it was called, um, newspaper that was published during the Second World War and in which the Jewish were depicted as vermin. The Americans depicted uh, the uh, Japanese as mice, for example, and the Germans as brutal apes. Uh, and then in the middle here, there is a more recent example of the genocide in Rwanda. And this was taken from a Hutu magazine. And in this text that you cannot really read probably, but um, trust me in my translation, it basically says, this is the weapon we will use to exterminate the cockroaches. So these are very clear examples of how sometimes um, very explicit metaphors are used. Typically animal metaphors are used to typify other groups. Now, we're quite, we know that these things happen, but they seem very far away and they seem all they need to happen in clear conflictual situations marked by very strong violence. Now, that's not always the case because you can also think of some modern day examples. Think about football, for example. In uh, football matches, it has been reported several times that when black players of the, oppo of the opposing team appear on the, on the field, that actually the supporters of uh, the other team are maybe mimicking um, ape kind of uh, movements, or even in some cases it has been reported that bananas are thrown on the field, again, to symbolize this idea of an animal or an ape-like metaphor. Um, in the top left corner here, you see an, an, a cartoon that was posted in the Washington Post, actually shortly after the inauguration of Barack Obama. So this is already a while ago. And in which he was actually suggested that he was, re or he was represented as an, as an ape there as well. So showing that actually this imagery or this type of dehumanizing imagery is also happening in modern days. And if these examples are all quite extreme and, and, and quite serious, actually we can find also more subtle uh, forms of dehumanization. Uh, one comes from Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop of, of uh, South Africa during the apartheid regime. And he in his book, for example, mentioned that certain newspapers would report that one person and four natives were injured, implying that natives are not real persons. Or, in the patient-medical uh, relationship uh, or doing interviews with, with medics, for example, 
Uh, it has been reported in the literature that patients might be referred to as cases or according to their medical condition. You know, nurses among themselves or medical or doctors and, med and nurses who basically talk about the liver in room 58 instead of naming the person by his name or her name. And this has led to a, a very extensive uh, research project in which I've been involved already for 20 years now, and in which we find typically that members of our own group are described using more human qualities, more human characteristic compared to those of the out group. And this does not only happen in conflictual situations, quite often actually it happens even with groups for which we actually typically like the people that are part of that group. But notwithstanding, we try to, or we tend to, dehumanize them sometimes as well. As a matter of fact, one of the examples I will get to in a minute actually is talking about groups or members of a group that we typically like a lot. So what is dehumanization? Well, very simply, it is perceiving others as less than human. That's what is typically used as its definition, at least in social psychology. And the way it is tested is typically by measuring some kind of human quality like reasoning or morality or certain types of emotions, mostly uniquely human emotions. And then we're gonna to measure to what extent these qualities are attributed or in some cases denied to uh, different group members compared to ourselves and others. As I said before, it is definitely not restricted to contexts of violence and conflict. And it can be both blatant or subtle, and I think the examples actually show that, but also relative or absolute in a sense that I can make a distinction relative to myself or relative to my group, or I can make it absolute in a sense that these people are actually not human or are non-human. So the first more specific example of dehumanization I wanna talk about um, is actually sexual objectification. Um, sexual objectification is, is, is everywhere around us. I mean, it's enough to open to any type of magazine to uh, quite often also put the television on or play video games. And what we will see is typically the sexualization and over-sexualization of women, often used to sell products or sometimes, as the examples here might show, actually um, shown directly as an object within the, the advertisement. You know? For example, you can buy them in a vending machine. Now, Italian television does not have a very good reputation when it comes to sexualizing women or sexual objectification in general. And actually, they always do this, in, before I have to give a talk, they always have this amazing example that I can use in my talk, and they did it again last week, um, when they showed actually this model who showed uh, women how they can be sexy and provocative when they go shopping. This was broadcasted, ironically, on the 25th of November uh, last week, so the day for the elimination of violence against women. And uh, what actually the, 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 the excerpt on television showed was how uh, women can pick up products that fall on the ground in a sexy and provocative way. This is actually what you see her doing now. Uh, but she also showed how you can take things from the upper shelf in a sexy and provocative way. I mean, there was a lot of reaction, of course, to this program because everybody agreed that this was not worthy uh, of national television. And the program has been suspended since then. So it had an, at least some consequence. So again, when we have to define sexual objectification, then this is the uh, definition that is most often used. So when objectified, women are treated as bodies that exist for the user consumption of others, stripped of their individuality and personality. And actually already in this definition, you can find some implicit references to senses of dehumanization. When I objectify a woman, I'm not interested in who she is, in her personality, again, in knowing what she's feeling, what she's going through or whatever. But what I'm interested in is her physical appearance. Said differently, it's a woman's body, body parts or her sexual functions are actually regarded as if they were capable of representing her. And I often show a picture, and, and I'm sorry if it might shock some people, even though it is from 1934, so I guess in 2020 it should still be uh, possible to present this. Uh, this is a painting that was uh, made by uh, René Magritte, who is a surrealist uh, Belgian painter. 
And I think it perfectly embodies what we might understand when we talk about sexual objectification. I mean, the face uh, and, 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 and anything it might express should be the window on a person's personality, on what they are feeling, what they are expressing. And uh, when we sexually objectify a woman, actually what we see is not that phase anymore. And it becomes completely reduced to her sexual body parts. So what we wanted to do in a line of research was actually showing that when a woman is objectified, she actually becomes literally more similar to a mindless object. And the questions we wanted to answer were, 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 were two, even though they're very similar to one another. Are mindless objects that appear among objectified men or women noticed to a different extent? Okay. And can it be that objectified women may be seen as more similar to mindless objects compared to objectified men? And so to do this, what we needed to do was to basically create a situation in which uh, human stimuli could be directly compared with more object-like stimuli. And of course, these objects needed to be perceptually as similar as possible. And this is the way that we managed to do that. So we, to objectify pictures or persons, what we typically do is we emphasize their body parts. And one way to do this is to basically get rid of some clothing. You know? So that's why we use pictures of people in underwear or in swimwear. And uh, we found a whole range of models that were depicted, um, as you can see on the left. And then we created for each of these pictures a doll-like uh, avatar that was very alike to the original, but in which all our pilots participants were, would agree that it, she was not a human being anymore. Now the picture on the right was always judged, judged as a doll-like picture, an avatar, uh, an object, but not a human being. We did the same for the male pictures. So again, we took pictures that might emphasize the uh, bodily features of the male uh, um, uh, targets as well. So that's why we call them male objectified stimuli. And we created again, the avatars or more doll-like versions of these pictures. So then we uh, put a people uh, in an EG. And what we did was an oddball paradigm. It's a very famous, wildly used paradigm. And it's very simple in a sense that people see pictures appearing in the middle of the screen and um, they have to categorize them by, do they see a human picture or do they see an object picture, okay? And uh, the only thing that we changed in this is we changed the frequency with which one of these appears. And typically what they would see was a lot of human pictures and then uh, one in five times they would see an object appearing like this one. So we know from research that has been done almost 50 years ago for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, we know that the oddball effect is basically that whenever this infrequent stimulus appears, there is a spike about 350, 300 milliseconds that starts about 300 milliseconds after stimulus onset. You know? And this spike is function of, and let's keep it simple, two things. On the one hand, the infrequency with which the uh, picture appears. So the more the picture is infrequent, the higher that peak will be. But we kept the infrequency constant between male and female pictures. So the other thing that we were more interested in was the extent to which there is a difference in the way the frequent and the infrequent stimulus are elaborated. Okay, so actually every difference in, in this spike of, the, of this uh, uh, positive spike at 300 milliseconds after the stimulus, we could say that it was due to differences in the elaboration of uh, this doll-like, um, object-like picture. And here are the results. So on top, you can see the male pictures. On the bottom, you see the female ones. And as you can see in both cases, you clearly see that around 350 in this case, milliseconds after the stimulus onset, you see the spike for the avatar pictures no? or the doll-like pictures. And that's a typical oddball effect. Now, what we were interested in is to what extent do they differ? So we put it one on top of the other. And as you can see, there is a clear difference between the two. The blue line, which represents the male um, um, uh, targets, you can see that the male doll is differentiated more from its human counterpart part, than the female doll. And actually said differently, we thought that, well, this means that if you show or you let an, an object appear 
among objectified women that is noticed less than when you let an object appear among objectified men. You know? Which, according to us, was a quite clear example of how direct and how literal, actually, women are, when objectified, are perceived by, uh, I must say, both men and women, because participants in this experiment were both men and women, and there was no difference between the two. Okay, so we wanted to extend on this research and actually go a step further in two ways. On the one hand, we wanted to show that this might happen also in more interracial or inter-ethnic contexts. And on the other hand, we also wanted to show that the difference in that elaboration that I already mentioned before is actually related to mind perception. And this was something that we could not uh, prove in the current experiment. So I'm gonna skip these. Uh, and what we found, so what we did was we made very similar um, uh, stimuli, uh, but we now used black and white um, stimuli, as you can see, we only used faces. And again, we created these avatars or doll-like faces based on their originals. And the procedure was exactly the same. So they saw longer arrays of human faces and then uh, once in a while, the avatar doll-like faces would appear. They again had to uh, categorize them with two keys on the keyboard and uh, the stimuli were blocked in, in according to race. So they would do a full block on only black faces and then white faces or vice versa. And the results were very, uh, were, were, uh, we were looking at was of course the P300 again, so this later response, but this time we also noticed that there were some differences earlier on. And I want to focus on those uh, um, a bit more closely. So actually the difference between black and white is something that people already noticed at about 100 milliseconds after the stimulus onset. Meaning that people um, notice the, the, the difference in color, in luminance between these two types of, of stimuli. But a bit later at around 150, 170 milliseconds after the starting or the presentation of the stimulus, not only the rays effect appeared, as you can see below, but there was also um, a significant difference, even though a bit smaller, between the real pictures and the doll-like pictures. So meaning that the thing I talked about or that I mentioned in the beginning is that before we can do anything or we can interact with, with, with any person, what we need to do is to basically detect that there is a mind, okay? And the first uh, element that we see of this mind detection happens at around this period, because indeed you see that people start elaborating slightly differently, the doll-like faces from the real faces. So I would say that this is the first moment that people notice the difference, you know? And this might be the initial uh, start of a mind uh, perception uh, process. Now, of course, later on, we were again interested to see the oddball effect. And as you can see, it, it appeared for both white and, and black faces. But if we put these two graphs one on the other and we did some statistical analysis, again, we could see that there was a clear difference between the two that was significant. So while the white doll faces were again more clearly different from the real uh, faces, this difference was smaller for the doll-like black faces. And this time we wanted to show, as I said before, that this was to some extent related to mind perception. You know? And uh, the way that we did that was to, uh, at the end of the experiment, do a kind of implicit association test, which typically measures how we associate and what the, the, um, the, the words we used were mind related words versus bodily related words that people had to categorize together with white and black faces. And what we saw was that overall participants were faster in associating the mindful words with the white faces and the bodily related words with the black faces compared to the re reverse combination. Now, the more that they did this, so the more that they associated mind to their in-group because all participants here were Caucasian and white, the more they associated mind words to their in-group, the more also they showed this bias in this later P300. You know? And you can see the correlation also on the slide. And I think this suggests clearly that indeed, what we are seeing here is a difference in mind perception, is a difference in the extent to which I associate the, these two ethnic groups with mental capacities. 
And of course, I guess that this is clearly related to processes of dehumanization and, and, and the things I talked about before. So to conclude, um, the, um, what I think we're trying to hit at or get at is basically what I would call the crux of dehumanization. Um, the crux of dehumanization for me has to do with two things. First of all, um, we might deny mental capacities to somebody. No? So the first thing we need to do is mind detection. And this seems to be a more general process in the sense that um, we didn't find any difference there clearly for black and white faces. What happens a bit later on is what we call mind attribution. And there actually what we will do is we will also use our preconcepts, the knowledge that we had before about these groups, which we typically met or which we measured in this case with the implicit association test. And that we're then going to use to basically make sense of the targets that we have in front of us. And um, these two elements then lead to the biases that we have seen before. No? First mind detection and then mind attribution. Now I guess it is important, or I think it is important, to talk about these issues of dehumanization and objectification because they have implications um, for then getting to empathic processes. And even though I haven't talked a lot about that, there is um, a fair amount of research that has shown that it also might lead to potential harm towards others and it might facil facilitate potential harm to others. So I hope that I gave you a glimpse of what this dehumanization process might mean and I'm happy to respond to any of your questions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jeroen. That was very clear. I would like to remind the audience that they can either um, raise their hand um, on Zoom or use Lido. Um, um, you just go to www.slido.com and then enter the event code, which is 16969, and then you can ask questions even there. Uh, so, I will um, ask you a question directly from the audience uh, on Slido that was also um, upvoted, uh, Jeroen. So, Ho uh, says, asks, uh, can anthropomorphizing the Earth help us save the planet from climate, from climate change? If so, can this be implemented in media to nudge pro-environmental behaviors? Well, I mean, it, I wouldn't say that it, that's going to be enough, but there is some research that has actually suggested, yes. Um, there is some research that has looked at the extent to which people anthropomorphize the earth or nature in general. Um, and it has shown that these people, the more that they do it, uh, the more they also tend to maybe give to uh, pro-environmental causes uh, or even maybe invest time themselves to do that. Um, now, if that is true and it has been shown experimentally, it is quite clear that some of the, the groups or um, um, cultural groups that have a very uh, a more anthropomorphic relation with nature also tend to be the ones who are not destroying it. So I think that that is actually pr probably a more clear or even maybe it's, it's, an, it's an anthropological example more than a psychological one. But I think there are many examples of of, of, of cultures, um, think about, um, I mean, some of the native Indians or uh, some of the uh, natives in, 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 in Australia or the Maori in, in New Zealand, they typically have a very different um, relationship with nature and also tend to, to use it or to not use it like we do and misuse it and overuse it. So of course it is it's maybe a leap to say that this is all related to anthropomorphism but there is indeed some proof that this might be one of the processes yes thank you um there is another question uh can the humanization conditioning from an early age change neural patterns associated with empathy um the beginning i didn't get can dehumanization can the i'll put it in the chat so everybody can see it um 
and dehumanization conditioning from an early age change neural patterns associated with empathy? Yeah, the thing I would like to know before I answer that question is this dehumanization conditioning uh, due to the fact that I am experiencing dehumanization or because I'm confronted with, with experiences that others are dehumanized. So the fact that I see that others dehumanize other groups and that in some way conditions me. Um, because if it is a second, uh, I would definitely say yes. I mean, um, there's hardly any research on the developmental, uh, yeah, the developmental path of dehumanization. I mean, there is some research and they have found it that since even the age of five, some kids are already uh, showing um, the tendency to, to dehumanize uh, members of other groups, for example, more than their own group. Uh, there are also some at later ages that has been shown as well, but we know very little of where that comes from. You know? While there is on prejudice, there is a fair amount of research that shows how uh, prejudice is transferred from mothers and fathers to their children. And there is some uh, interesting research that actually suggests that it might be the more implicit prejudice that is responsible for um, uh, this transfer instead of the explicit prejudice that expressed by them. So it's basically the, the uncertain reactions that parents might have when they are interacting with a member of another group that children pick up more than maybe the racist joke once makes once in a while in a, in a, in a social situation, not to give two examples. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised that things actually happen similarly uh, for, for, um, for dehumanization as well. So that I indeed, the more that I'm exposed to media all, already from an early age that makes certain associations, dehumanizing associations uh, uh, between certain groups and, 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 and these animal metaphors, or in the case of women, just by showing more of their bodies instead of their personalities, that that kind of makes me, it, it learns me to have a gaze or to have a, a vision on, on where I should look and what I should evaluate, no? So I guess, I guess that's definitely the case. When it is more like how I am experiencing dehumanizing experience and how that might lead to, um, to different neural patterns, I don't know, I must admit. Um, I think there's, there's very little research that actually takes the perspective of the dehumanized. Um, unfortunately. So um, I'm, I'm, I don't know how to respond to that one. Um, yes, the, I think that person was um, clarifying that what they meant uh, was being exposed to stimuli that promote objectifying other people. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I responded to that. Okay, uh, so we there is another question, sorry, that I have uh, missed. Okay, um, if you're happy, we can take another question or if there is anybody from the audience that wants to ask directly a question to Yerun, uh, they can just turn on the microphone and ask. Okay, so I'll ask you from the slide. Oh, see, it's very, it's very useful, this platform. <laughs> 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 is that possible that dehumanization and sex objectification will be more often observed in violent and sex offenders? Yes, um, it is. Um, I mean, there is, I'm not aware of any research on sex offenders per se that has um, looked at and how they perceive women as such, even though well, I, I'll, I'll come back to that. The thing is that there is definitely experimental research that has shown that the more I have uh, and, 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 and I objectify women, the more that I also tend to uh, harass them. It's, it's uh, one of the experiments, for example, that was done at the University of Padova some years ago, was that they showed men either um, 10 minutes, was not even four minutes of primetime Italian television, but put together so that it was showing similar images as the one that I showed. Or they were showing an interview of a Pulitzer Prize, um, female Pulitzer Prize that was interviewed because of her competence or a more neutral uh, situation. And then actually they were put into a chat room with an, another woman 
all participants were men and uh, they could send jokes to one another. And of course, among these jokes, there were also highly sexist jokes. And so uh, they simply looked, given that sexist jokes and sent them unwarrantedly or on, on uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's telling sexist joke to a per to a woman that is not asking or is not there is no context that allows it. Let's say, is seen as a form of of harassing behavior. Um, what they found is that the men that were exposed to these um, images of sexually uh, or sexualized images of women, they were actually more inclined to send more of these sexist jokes compared to the men that were exposed to the other conditions. So. There is definitely evidence that shows that sexual objectification plays a role in these types of, uh, of, of, uh, of situations. I'm not aware of systematic evidence that shows that how sex offenders per se perceive women. Uh, there might be, but I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately I'm not a clinician myself, so I, I follow maybe that research a bit less. Uh, but there's definitely, from a purely experimental perspective, there seems to be a link. Okay, thank you very much. There are no further questions. Um, Laura, are you happy to start with your talk? Can I ask a question? Oh, or uh, one more? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. So, um, essentially, um, you talked about examples of dehumanizing people with regards to animals. Um, so, can this be, it, is the same effect kind of observed when you look at uh, dehumanizing people as machines. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, in South Korea, students um, can be encouraged by um, people within education to be, um, yeah, really hardworking, act like robots to just fully study 100% of all the time. Can this overall have, um, what kind of effect can this have on, um, like, the person's outcome at the end? Mm hmm well, you're absolutely right. I mean, I didn't, um, I didn't, I tried to define dehumanization, but I didn't define humanness, no. Um, the thing that we deny to other people, I didn't went into great detail there, but there is plenty of research that has tried to do that and try to define humanness. And what is typically done or uh, uh, underlined is that it is a, a two-dimensional model. So on the one hand, indeed, you can have dehumanization uh, by associating people to animals, and that typically implies that you're going to deny them uniquely human characteristics. So the characteristics that distinguish us from other species, and then you have rationality, morality, being civil, things like that. Uh, but you can also do indeed uh, get people more closer to machines or to robots, and um, then what you're actually doing is denying them what is called human nature. So more central traits of what it means to be a human being. And those are typically related to emotional responsiveness, to being open, to being flexible, to have a soul, no? Um, and, um, and there are several instances in which, in which both have shown to happen. In some instances, it happens that actually maybe the machine metaphor is more easily used and is more, um, uh, um, yeah, is, is, is more effective or is, is, is more used by people. Actually, the things that have shown to modulate this are many. So it can be the target and some targets uh, it are maybe eas more easily associated to animal metaphors or to the robot metaphors. Um, uh, in, in, in the difference between policing and, and criminals, for example, the police has been one of the metaphors that is often used for police is that they become like machines. They have no heart, they have no emotions. And while the criminals are typically more associated with more animal-like metaphors, no, they're brutal and, and, and so on. So that's just to give an example. So it can be target-based. Of course, it can also lie in the context. When I talk about medical dehumanization or dehumanization in the medical practice, there quite often machine-like metaphors have been used more because our bodies or who we are become like things to repair no? uh, for a, a doctor. So in the literature, you see more of these mis machine-like metaphors popping up. But you can even have cultural differences. So actually, if you ask the same question in different culture, what does it mean to be human? 
you get sometimes very different responses. We did this a uh, couple of years ago in Australia, Italy, and China. And what we found is that actually the uh, Australians tend to emphasize a lot this human nature type of characteristics. So they like to distinguish them the most of the machines. No, they don't mind the animals as much. While the Chinese do exactly the opposite. They actually tend to define their human as, especially in contrast with the animals, and they don't mind the machine so much. And then we did it also in Italy. And in Italy, we couldn't distinguish the two. So apparently Italians, well, and then there's an obvious joke, of course, they're used to eat from both plates. <laughs> but anyway, they, uh, they tended to define their human as using both dimensions. No? So they didn't have a preferred one, let's say. But I mean, this is all speculative, what I'm saying now, not the, the thing I just explained, but what I'm about to say is that, well, you could even say that this might then make certain practices more um, accepted in a country. If I'm not afraid of the machine metaphor, maybe certain working conditions, like you mentioned yourself in South Korea, might be more acceptable to a certain extent, no? Because they're not seen as dehumanizing. Because what I see as dehumanizing in China, at least, I'm not sure if it is the same in South Korea, is being equated to an animal. No? Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, it's a rich research field. There's a lot of, of things you can associate it with, of course. Um, but you're absolutely right that mechanical dehumanization is something that can happen as much as animalistic dehumanization. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can we have some uh, time to take a little break, like really two or three minutes, and then we are back with uh, Laura's uh, talk. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. We will uh, see, uh, we'll meet here again in uh, two or three minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, should we restart? Is it? Um, Laura, are you happy to restart? Yes, sure. Okay. So, um, as I said, Laura, um, we talk about the role of affective touch in health and disease. So, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks also, Jeroen, again, <laughs> for joining. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you to the organizer and Federica for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, so, in this talk, we are going to discuss um, another way in which we can overcome um, the self-other boundaries, which is via uh, touch. Um, so, I don't think that I need to um, convince you this year how important is touch, uh, since sadly we all, we hope I've been quite touch deprived and touchless. Uh, so both due to social isolations, but also due to social distancing. Uh, so if uh, people suffering from, uh, co from COVID-19, they lose uh, the sense of smell or taste, we can say that touch is the sense that we all lost. Um, so really touch is the sense that I paid the highest price during this uh, pandemic. However, almost paradoxically, uh, we also know that during this pandemic, nurses and doctors, they talked about uh, the, the fact that the unique ca characteristics that touch um, has, has actually helped them to uh, find a way to communicate uh, with patients. So even when they could not talk or smile um, or even being seen properly because of their protective equipment, uh, medical professionals said that they could always rely uh, on a pat on the shoulder or holding a hand or squeezing an arm to reassure patients and to let them know that they were not um, alone. So I particularly find this, uh, um, this picture uh, quite striking and it was in the news uh, quite recently of this medical doctor hugging our COVID patients in the Houston hospital. Uh, so I've recently written an essay for uh, E.ON, which is an online magazine in which I argue that touch can really be considered as a language uh, that binds our minds and body to the broader um, social world. So obviously touch with the loved one is, uh, is very important because it allowed us to really um, to build uh, social bonds and uh, is very important in affiliative behaviors. 
However, touch is very important also with strangers. So maybe during this year we realize how much we're missing the random touch and um, the, the, the touch that happen on a daily basis, daily, daily basis, and we don't even really realize it. So touch is quite powerful if we think about how important it is to have a path on the shoulder in a certain moment. And it's really the way which we can close the physical gap between self and other. So how do we know that touch is so important? Uh, science has dedicated quite a lot of time studying touch, especially recently. So we know that touch is the first sense to develop ontogenetically and is mediated by the skin, which is our widest organ in terms of dimensions and functions. What is very crucial and unique about touch is that it's mutual, so you can never touch someone without being touched in turn, while you can look at someone without being looked back. And it's multi-sensory in the sense that every time we touch someone, there is also a cascade of other signals, such as like smell or the information about the temperature of the other person. So it's really a multi-sensory um, information. So that's why it's been suggested that touch can really represent the substrate for the development of the social brain and is, in, is an initial modality to distinguish self and other. In particular, interpersonal touch, which is touch occurring among two or more individuals, plays a crucial role, crucial role in uh, development. We know about the beneficial effect of massage therapy, for example, for in the case of mental health, but also in the case of preterm infants. And we also know the maternal stroking within the first weeks of life can reduce the association between maternal depression and a negative outcome later on in infancy. So we can say that we need touch throughout all our life and especially in old age when usually we have much more reduced opportunity for tactile social interactions. So the message is that touch is more than a simple sensory stimulation on the skin. But what actually happens when something touches our skin? So we know that there is an immediate activation of the fast um, conducting a beta nerve system, which is a rapid first touch system, which has obvious advantages for our survival, since it allows us to react promptly when something touches our skin, in case that there is a potential threat to our survival. In parallel, and only when touch has some specific characteristics and is likely to have an emotional affective meaning, there is also the activation of the city offering system, which is a slow second touch system, which has less obvious advantages for our survival, but it really provides the neurobiological substrate for the development and function of the social brain. So it shouldn't come as a surprise, the idea that we really have a specialized system just for the detection of affective touch. How do we know about this? Uh, through many studies that they use this uh, neurophysiological technique, which is called uh, macroneurography, which allowed us to record the single unit activity from the nerves in the skin. And thanks to these techniques, we, ha we have defined a bit what are the characteristics of this affective touch. So we know that there is a specific velocity, which is between one and 10 centimeters per second. So not too slow and not too fast. It's really the velocity in which you will spontaneously touch uh, a loved one. So the caress velocity, basically. And what is very interesting is that, is, is that the more the CT system is activated, the more the participants report a uh, pleasant percept. So there is literally a linear correlation between the activation of these fibers on the skin and the pleasantness that the participants report. So this system has been found only on the hairy skin of our body. So for example, we don't have it on the palm of our hands. And also, yes, a specific uh, preferred temperature, which is the one typical of the human skin, which is 32 degrees. And also what is very interesting is that it seems to activate the posterior insula rather than the somatosensory cortex. So this system seems to share much more characteristics with interoceptive pathway, which are the pathway that define uh, the perception of our internal signals. System. So as I said at the beginning, the system is really important for affiliative behaviors, it's very important for the way which we form and maintain 
uh, social bonds and it's also very important to the way we communicate emotions through touch. So uh, the majority of people can tell that if someone touches you within this velocity, they're trying to convey a positive uh, message to you. However, we didn't think that this was uh, the full story, so we decided to investigate what's the role of affective touch for the way we become aware of our body as our role, which is defined as uh, body ownership. So we use the, the rubber hand illusion, which is a well-established illusion of body ownership, which allowed to play a little bit around uh, with the way we uh, we uh, perceive our, our body as our own. So briefly, the, the participant's hand is placed inside a box out of view, and then we place a rubber hand in front of them. And after less than a minute of synchronous stroking of the two hands, the majority of the people perceive the sensation that the rubber hand become their own hand. So they embody the rubber hand, basically. So this uh, effect has been firstly reported in 1998, and since then there have been a gazillion of studies replicating the main effect. Um, so in this study that we conducted firstly in uh, 2013, we wanted to see whether there was an effect of velocity. So whether if we were applying slow versus fast velocities would play a role in, this, in the experience of this illusion. illusion. So what we found is that slow, caress like touch, was perceived as more pleasant and also enhanced the perceived embodiment of the rubber hand more than fast emotional neutral touch. So when we're doing when we're, we're doing the illusion with slow touch, the effect was much stronger. So we concluded that this touch might play a unique contribution to the sense of body ownership and by implication to our embodied psychological self. And we were also very happy that other labs replicated the same findings and we also did a few years ago. Now since uh, this type of touch, so affective touch, seems to be very important for the way we perceive our body, we decided to investigate this modality on a clinical population we present, which present body image distortions and lack of awareness such as anorexia nervosa. So anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder which is characterized by restricting eating and an obsessive fear of gaining weight. The etiology remains unknown, however we know the impairments in social cognition and the reward circuits play an important role in the onset and maintenance of the disorder. However, there are hardly any investigations on the relationship between these two. So the aim of the study was to investigate whether anorexia nervosa was associated with a reduced perceived pleasantness during social interactions. So we tested 26 people with anorexia nervosa and 30 healthy controls. They were coming in the lab and we were delivering touch either at slow or fast velocities and we were asking them to tell us how pleasant was the touch. There was also a social manipulation that I'm not going to go through today. So what we found is that CT touch, which is the slow touch, uh, slow affective touch, was perceived as significantly less pleasant uh, by anorexia nervosa people compared to healthy controls. However, there were no differences between groups in the perception of the fast uh, emotional neutral touch. So we suggested that this uh, result might indicate uh, that there is probably an involvement of uh, interoceptive perception, so the way in which we feel our internal bodily signals, and potentially we proposed a link with also a body image uh, distortion that we observe in these patients. And again, these results have been replicated by two independent groups. However, there was an open question, and there is still an open question, which is whether this effect is more like related to a cause, a consequence of the disorder. So it's a bit of a chicken egg situation. It's very difficult to answer this question, but we can, we can try to get a better understanding. Uh, so what we did is that we investigated the perception of affective touch in both act, in both women with and recovered from um, anorexia nervosa. So we uh, tested 27 people with anorexia nervosa, 24 people who have recovered and 30, 30 healthy controls. And of course we can have a big debate on the definition of recovery from anorexia nervosa. So if uh, anyone has any specific question we can discuss later. 
So uh, in this specific study, we were asking two things. So first, to imagine to be in touch by different materials and they had to judge how pleasant uh, was the touch. Um, and also they were actually touched by brushes the, um, which were moved at different velocities and they had to say how pleasant was the touch. So what we found is that both um, people with a recover from anorexia nervosa perceived um, both anticipated the tactile experience. So that they, when, they were, when they were imagining about being touched, but also when they were actually touched, uh, they perceived touch as less pleasant compared to healthy controls. However, in this study, we didn't find any specific relation to the CT optimality of the touch. So this effect was not specific for slow touch only, but for any kind of touch. So they were perceiving any kind of touch as less pleasant. And what is interesting is also that these differences uh, between the two groups, between the perception of uh, uh, slow touch, was actually uh, predicted by differences in the belief, so in how much they thought that they were going to like the touch, alexitime, which is the way in which we experience and uh, recognize emotions and interoceptive uh, um, sensibility. So from this study, we concluded that um, the, the um, impairment in perception of touch seems to persist even after otherwise successful recovery. Now, this finding about uh, uh, people with anorexia nervosa, they fit very well with a tendency in the field to investigate the relationship between affective touch and mental health. So other groups have been investigated, for example, the perception of affective touch in a neurodevelopmental disorder, such as uh, autism, also perception of touch uh, in patients with interpersonal traumatization and post-traumatic stress disorder, but also in the case of uh, chronic pain. And our own group has investigated also the perception of affective touch in uh, people who um, uh, with right hemispheric stroke patients. So these, uh, these people tend to uh, lose a bit uh, ownership of their body and they don't recognize their body as their own anymore. Uh, so we found that this uh, impairment in the perception of affective touch was related to the damage, to, the, to a damage in the insula particularly, and also that by applying affective touch actually there was an increase in the uh, in the way they were recovering their own uh, body ownership so to summarize the, what i showed you so far uh, i showed you the affective touch seems to play uh, an important role to the sense of body ownership and the way we get to recognize um, our body as our own and that's anorexia nervosa present a uh, disordered affective touch system and we um, hypothesized that this might have important uh, implication for the way they actually recognize their body uh, as their own and also to the body image distortion that they show. And also that both uh, people with that recover from uh, anorexia nervosa, they tend to um, have these distortions in the perception of affective touch. Now, as is often the case, it seems a bit uh, um, difficult to bridge the gap between the lab and the real world. So it's a bit like, what does this um, research tell us uh, about how we use touch on our daily basis? So to reconnect a little bit with the, with the initial slide and to this uh, essay that I wrote for the uh, ION, we know that touch is really the um, ultimate ultimate tool for social connection. And what is really good and the good news is that we're actually born fully accessorized to make the most of it. So we know that uh, since we are in the womb, we are able to perceive affective touch. Um, and actually that, that tactile system is already developed. Um, and therefore we are already, when we are born, is really, really important for us to be touched in a city optimal way, so in a slow way, which is actually the way in which usually no newborns are, ta are touched. So it's not an exaggeration to talk about touch as a kind of language. Uh, it's a language that we learn throughout our life with interaction with our loved one from the very early stage of our life. And since we uh, use touch on a daily basis, even without realizing it, we actually become very, very good. We, be we become very fluent in this language to the point that we are really good at uh, reading other people's intention and emotions based on the way in which um, they touched us. 
And the language of touch affects not only the way we relate with others, but also the way we relate with ourselves and our bodies across the lifespan. So this relationship also has an important uh, impact on our psychological well-being. So there is really a close link uh, between the perception of social touch and mental health. So we lose a lot by depriving ourselves of touch. Um, and it's very important that in this new normal that we have defined, uh, we actually take into consideration way in which we can go back to uh, touch each other. So with this, I would like to thank my uh, PhD supervisor, Katerina Fotopoulou and Paul Jenkinson, and all the clinical team at University of Milan, and my current boss uh, at Karolinska Institute, Eric Carson, and you for listening. I'm happy to take any question. I also have my email address and the Twitter accounts if anyone wants to contact me afterwards. Thank you, Laura, for uh, this very interesting talk. Uh, we have one question from Slido, from Slido, but again, I would like to um, encourage people to um, just raise their hand and turn on their microphone and interact directly with the speakers, in this case with Laura. Um, I, although I don't see any raised hand for now, so I'll, uh, I'll ask you what was asked in Slido. Uh, anybody can again go uh, on Slido and um, uh, just type in the event code, which is 16969, and ask the, the questions. Okay, so we have some actually. Uh, the first one is I'm wondering how this is affected by allodynia. Um, so I'm not sure. The right pronunciation, Caroline, help me. <laughs> uh, when light touch is perceived as pain. Uh, yeah, so I'm not an expert in the field, but I read uh, something about it. And um, uh, so let's say all the kind of touch, and this includes also affective touch, pain, and temperature. They do share some sort of pathway from the skin, from the skin through the spinal cord to the brain, although uh, they they might differentiate. A little bit. So this is still not clarified. Uh, for example, a recent study that just came out uh, showed that, for example, per perception of temperature and pain, they seem to share much more than the perception of affective touch. Um, what we know about the perception of affective touch or light touch is that there is a strong um, neurophysiological components, so the, the, the actual activation of the skin fibers play an important role, but there is also another important aspect, which is the top-down manipulation, man, top-down effect on the perception of this touch. So a lot of time when we were actually touched, the way in which we perceive this kind of touch depends, for example, on our past experiences of the way we have been touched in the past. So we kind of learn as well to uh, uh, to associate some feelings with the touch. So in the case, uh, uh, as I say, I'm not an expert in the field, but there is some sort of overlaps between the, the pathway between pain and affective touch. Uh, and I think there is both uh, this bottom-up component, so from the skin to the brain, but there is also strong effect of from the brain um, to the actual behavior that's uh, um, influenced on the way in which uh, light touch is perceived as painful. I don't know if this answer a little bit. Um, so we have another question. Can touch therapy be used to overcome aversion to affective touch? Uh, I missed the first part of the question, sorry. Can touch therapy be mm. used to overcome aversion to affective touch? Yes. Um, so the idea when we did the study with the um, people with anorexia nervosa, it was exactly this. So whether uh, we could find a way to actually um, connect uh, with the patients and potentially to, um, to um, develop uh, therapeutic uh, approaches. Um, so for what I can tell, uh, I was a bit uh, skeptical when I started these studies, especially if it was gonna be difficult to get uh, people to be touched uh, for an experiment since they really don't like to be touched, but I didn't have uh, these kind of issues. So probably um, 
I believe that since there is this uh, top-down effect that I was saying, so the fact of being used to be touch and to accumulate knowledge about touch, um, so I believe that actually is possible. Uh, this has not been developed yet, but I think it's possible to actually build therapies in which we um, we habituate people to be touched a bit more and probably might also increase uh, the perception of uh, uh, tactile affectivity. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions? I can't see them on slide. Any new question? Um, anybody from the audience that wants to just turn on their microphone and ask? Yes. Who? Who? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I've got a question about like using touch within. Um, school places, would you recommend using like massage kind of classes within schools and and potentially a, a further question is like, is it bad if like um, uh, like uh, people who work within education to actually, you know, hug children if they're and if they are actually going for a really tough time? And I know that there comes with like safeguarding issues. But I just want to hear your thoughts on it, really. Yes, yeah, this is a very good point. Um, so there is a big debate. I have to say that even before the pandemic, uh, touch was having a hard time in the sense that it's been going through really a prohibition era, era in which people said, oh, you should not touch uh, children that much. Uh, you should be careful, by the way. And this is true, you should be careful, obviously. But then I think that eliminate touch completely is even worse. Um, so I think there should be the space to build a nuanced um, use of touch, so to actually contextualize it uh, properly. So I actually advise it to, um, to have a space, to have safe touch, uh, but of course this has to be, um, you know, this is the job of policymakers and I, I cannot say what should be done or not. But as someone who studied touch, I know that it's very, very, very important that people uh, should be able to touch and to be touched um, in a safe space. Yes, it's very important for the development, very important to build uh, um, social relationship. And it's also very important to be safe. Uh, so touch uh, uh, is not, all good or all bad. And as any language, uh, there are spaces for misunderstanding. Uh, but I think it's very important to use it um, carefully, but to use it, yes. Thanks. Okay, if there are no further questions, I would um, thank all the speakers and everybody who attended today. Um, please uh, just answer a quick poll just to tell us whether you like the event or not that is now on uh, uh, Slido and um, yeah again from the same with the same event code and if there are in the meantime any other questions also to the other to me or Jeroen um, or Laura as well uh, you can certainly take this time we have we have five minutes left and we can take other questions <clears throat> Anything from the audience? It was a very interesting um, series of talk. Um, we hope to see other activities like this and to, to see uh, always more um, people also from the real world <laughs> working actively with people that um, can engage some exchange in this kind of activities to, together with the academic audience. And uh, yes, I think that is it. Uh, Caroline, is there anything else I should um, say other than, of course, uh, um, thanking again uh, the CHBH and the Institute for Mental Health that hosted this uh, event today and uh, our speakers and you <laughs> for help me, helping me with all the organization. Did I say all or is there anything else, Caroline? 
don't think so. I think that's everything. Sounds good. I mean, um, if anybody has any questions afterwards, they can still access Slido um, to send those questions in, whether it's to one of the speakers or all of them. Um, and we'll have a record of them to send them on to, to the speakers. Um, and if we do get any of those questions, we can send them around with the recordings to all the people that signed up and registered as well. Okay, we will try to have also subtitles for the, um, for the recordings, uh, certainly in English, but we will try also in Italian for our Italian crowd. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's it. So thank you very much also for the questions. <laughs>